This presentation was made to the National Conference of Standards Laboratories International, the Twin Cities section meeting on September 13th, 2017. The topic is the calibration certificate. It was presented by Gary C. Meyer of J&G Technology, who holds both the ASQ Certified Calibration Technician and Certified Quality Engineer Certifications. When a calibration lab performs a calibration, they compare an instrument to the standard, which is traceable back to the National Institute of Standards and Technology. The calibration lab has to convey that information to the customer. The calibration lab does that in two ways. First of all, it generates a calibration sticker that goes on the instrument itself to show that it was calibrated. It gives the name of the organization doing the calibration, an ID number for the equipment, the date calibrated, who it was calibrated by, and also the possible due date. The second document is that of the calibration certificate, which is the topic we will be discussing. This calibration certificate is sometimes called a calibration report, and its purpose is to convey to the customer what the results of the calibration were. Therefore, the calibration certificate must have certain things in its content in order to convey all that information to the customer. The customer then has to interpret that information. So how would you define a calibration certificate? Here is the NIST definition. Calibration certificates are the visible outputs of the testing laboratory. This comes from their document called the NIST SOP1 or Standard Operating Procedure 1, Section 1.1, which is titled Recommended Standard Operating Procedure for the Preparation of Calibration Certificates. Looking at the characteristics when preparing a calibration certificate, first they should be prepared with the utmost care to ensure that they accurately convey all information pertaining to the testing so that reports may be used with maximum benefit by all concerned. Number three, carefully prepared calibration certificates must contain or refer to all information necessary to justify the test results. It may have references out to different documents. So why spend time discussing calibration certificates? First of all, it's an important tool to convey calibration results to the customer, and it should be designed to be customer friendly. It also uh, brings you to remembrance that you're producing a product for the customer. It serves as a record of calibration for the calibration laboratory as well. So why spend time discussing certificates? Compliance to standards must be met in some cases, and that content for the calibration certificate is defined in the standard, such as ISO 17025, an international standard for calibrating and testing laboratories, or the Z540, which is the American standard for calibration laboratories, or it also may be stated in some contracts with your customers. It also leads us to examine our calibration certificates to see if we meet the requirements or recommendations of industry. And it provides a platform for standardized content. So where is content defined? In ISO 17025, the 2005 version, section 5.10.2 and 5.10.4 refer to calibration certificates and give information about the content. We will be looking at that content shortly. Also, Z540.3, the 2006 version, 
in section 5.3.8.1 refer to this as a calibration report and give some specifics of what must be in that calibration report or certificate. It may also be defined by policy in your company or organizations such as the USATA, the U.S. Army uh, Testing and Diagnostics. Or if you're looking for content and what should be in a calibration certificate, the NCSLI recommendations of SOP-1 are a good place to start. There are five basic questions that need to be answered when looking at calibration certificates. One is what was calibrated. Two, when was it calibrated? Three, where was it calibrated? Four, who calibrated it? And we depart from the W's to go to an H. How was it calibrated? Looking at the ISO 17025 requirements, the first one listed is that the document have a title. It describes the document. For example, test report, calibration certificate, or certificate of calibration. Also, the name and the address of the calibration laboratory should be on that calibration certificate. And also the location where the calibration is performed if it's different from the above address. The report should also have a unique ID number or reference. For example, it could be a serial number on each page plus the page number itself. Also, the name and address of the customer. For third-party calibration houses, this might be a customer at an external location. For those doing in-plant calibration for their own use, this would be uh, just the location of the plant or wherever their other plant might be located. Another requirement is the ID of the method being used. This can be satisfied by reference to a specific calibration procedure. Also, the identification of the unit under test plus a description of the condition of the unit itself. Also, some dates are required. First of all, the date it was received if critical to the calibration results. If not, that can be omitted. However, the date of calibration is required. Also, reference to any sampling plan used, if applicable, to the calibration. Also, the calibration results should show the units of measurements. It may be a separate data report referenced or attached or part of the calibration certificate. Also, the names, functions, signatures, or equivalent identification of persons authorizing the report or the cert. Where relevant, a statement to the effect that results relate only to the items calibrated. Another section of ISO 17025, that is section 5.10.4, lists three additional items and insert the clause where necessary for interpretation of calibration results. A would be the environmental conditions, normally the humidity and the temperature, and that is at the point of calibration at that location. B is the measurement uncertainty and C is the evidence of traceability. Also in this section, it refers to a certificate of compliance. This is a statement that the unit under test meets a specification. Note that the measurement uncertainties must be considered when making this statement. Another important consideration is the due time, which is set by the calibration interval. ISO 17025 says that 
you should not specify the due date unless the interval has been agreed upon with the customer. One, if you are an in-house calibration lab, that is calibrating for your own plant, you are the customer and you can put a due date on there based on whatever you have uh, determined that the interval should be. If you are a third-party calibration lab, the external customer must agree on that interval. They take the responsibility or the risk for the calibration interval. This should be in writing, either the approval on a purchase order or an approval via a letter or email. Also note that the above may be superseded by government requirements such as the uh, FDA. Under Z540.3, the U U.S. Uh, standard, Section 5.3.8.1 talks about calibration reporting. It refers to th this document as a calibration report rather than a calibration certificate. But the content is pretty much the same as what we have just gone through in 17025. We'll take a brief look at these items as well. The U.S. Army is also working to standardize their calibration certificates at this time. According to some recent email comments that I've had, they have uh, also called these test reports instead of calibration certificates. And the other uh, quote from this uh, gentleman was that I believe the USATA, U.S. Army Test Measurement and Diagnostic, is in the process of standardizing these test reports across the enterprise. So the military would also be an organization that would standardize their own reports. As we look at calibration certificates, what are some of the other requirements? There may be a requirement for a logo and an accreditation number issued by an accreditation body, uh, such as A2LA, A-Class, and uh, several others. Also, a copyright notice may be in order. A statement that the certificate can only be reproduced in full without written permission uh, from the issuing lab. And optional would be a signature of a person authorizing or checking the report. If you are a non-accredited laboratory and you want to design a calibration certificate, there's a place where you can go for some help. It's the NIST website. They have the standard operating procedure, as we have mentioned, the recommended standard operating procedure for preparation of calibration certificates. This will cover a lot of the items that we have already discussed. The recommendation of this document says that you should have a title, which we've looked at for both 17025 and Z540. You can use the title of calibration certificate. We should have the name and address of the calibration laboratory, unique ID for each page of the certificate, name and address of the customer or client, method of calibration used, the idea, uh, uh, identification of the item calibrated. Also the calibration item date of receipt, calibration results, that is as found and as left, the name, title, signature of the person doing the calibration, environmental conditions, statement of measurement uncertainty, and an ID of the standards used. You should also show the evidence of, to support traceability, additional information required by special methods, include page numbers for multi-sheets, and a statement regarding duplication, and specify calibration intervals when required. When undergoing an audit, auditors will examine calibration certificates for compliance to a specific standard. They will be looking for the presence of the required items, 
also the accuracy of the content. A checklist is a useful tool to focus on the required items. I have put together a little auditing tool for uh, the 17025 calibration certificates. There are 25 items here and these are pulled out of the 17025 document with a little checklist to go through to see if those items are on a particular calibration certificate. So you should identify the document first of all and then go through checking out either yes or no or not required depending on the circumstances. This auditing tool is a free download. It's an Excel spreadsheet available from J&G Technology on the website at jg-technology.com. This is an editable document so you can add or remove items for your particular use. Next I'd like to show you a couple of examples of some real-life situations. Here's a calibration certificate. It's a two-page certificate from Boston Scientific in the Twin Cities area provided for this training. You'll notice at the top is the blue area with black words called calibration certificate, the title. Under that we have some of the header information and then that's followed by the central area which has the data, followed by some signature lines at the bottom. Page number two shows some of the standards that were used. It also has a place for some comments and then some electronic signatures which are used for the computer storage and signing. Next I want you to use the checklist to go down through this particular calibration procedure and see if all of those things are included or not. First of all, you will see on this slide all of the different bubbles with numbers inside of them. Those numbers correspond to the auditor checklist. Number four is the calibration lab name. Number nine is the identification of the calibrated item, which includes the gauge number, description, manufacturer, and the model. Number 11 is the date of calibration, and number 12 is the due date for the next calibration. At the top, we see the number one title of the document, which is calibration certificate. Also for number five, we have the calibration lab being on site. There is not an address listed here, but it would be the same address as the calibrating laboratory since it shows that the calibration was done on site. Number 19, we have two bubbles here. One says found out of calibration, no, and as left pass and fail, and it uh, passes which is also a statement about the results of the calibration. At the bottom we see two number 23's in bubbles. One is reference to the calibration procedure and the other is to the specific uh, document uh, which is uh, uh, listing the uh, specs or the specifications or tolerances. So these would be both statements regarding the reference to the calibration procedure and method. In the center of the calibration certificate we have bubble number 15 which is the calibration data that is included in this particular certification. Over on the left bubble 17 is the ID of the person who performed the calibration. There's a place for signature here and also there's a reference here that electronic signatures were used which we'll see on the next page. Number 18 is the ID of the person authorizing the certification. And then 24 is a statement about duplicating the document. Number 3 
is the page number of the document. In this case, it's page one of two. Page two brings up bubble number 22, which is evidence of traceability. This is satisfied by specifying what the standards are that are used for this calibration. Also another nice feature in this cert is that the due date and last action date of the standard is also listed. There's a place for comments. And then at the bottom we see 17 and 18, which 17 is the ID of the, or the ID of the person who performed the calibration. And 18 is the ID of the person that authorized the certification. Also at the bottom of page two, we see the bullet number two or the bubble number two, which is the unique ID of the document. The 17 and 18 we've talked about before, the ID of the person who performed calibration and the person authorizing the cert is 18. 24 would be the statement about duplicating the document, which is also included here on page two. And then the page number. So this is a test. Was there anything missing in this calibration certificate that uh, we didn't identify on the auditor checklist? Here are some things that I noticed and they might be explained by the company producing the calibration certificate. First of all, our bullet number five is that it's the address of the calibration lab, which I did not see on the cert. Also, bubble number 20 was missing, the environmental conditions. These are not always required. Many labs put the humidity and the temperature on the cert, whether it's needed or not. However, in the case of the uh, weights, we may not uh, really need that information but it's a good idea. And then also the measurement uncertainty statement, which is uh, checklist item number 21. Also, if this were a third party uh, lab, instead of a laboratory doing their own in-plant calibration, there's a couple of potential things that uh, we might want to see on the list as well, or on the cert, that is, uh, seven and eight said that you should have the customer name and the address. And number 25, if it were 17025 accredited or Z540, there should be some accreditation logo. And that would be if it were applic uh, applicable. At the outset of this training, I said there were five basic questions that a calibration certificate should answer. Here's example number two, the calibration certificates supplied by Kevin Rust of MTS Systems for this uh, presentation. Those five questions were to answer, where was the calibration done? How was the calibration done? When, when is, was it done? And who did the calibration? And then what was done, which will be answered on the next page. For the where, we see at the top, uh, the name of the calibration laboratory, as well as the address of the calibration laboratory. Then we have some uh, header information uh, along with the how part of that, which is uh, several uh, paragraphs here, three paragraphs of verbiage uh, that is uh, re required by ISO 17025 or statements uh, required by 17025. Also included here are the when, the date calibrated, and the who, the technician doing the calibration. This is a three-page certificate. Let's look at the next page. The next page contains the data. There are 12 channels in this strain gauge signal conditioner system. In this page, uh, we have the calibration data 
for channels 1 through 4. Notice also that each channel has its own color, which makes it easier to keep the data straight. And it also relates to the graphical information down below. So the calibration graph for channel 1 through 4 is shown just below the data. And then we have another set of calibration data for channels 5 through 8, followed by the calibration graph, which shows all of the readings here to be within the specifications. On page 3, we have calibration data and the graph for channels 9 through 12 plus a graphic for the baseline noise for each one of the different channels as shown in various colors. And then there's also a place here for a set of notes. It's also uh, very important that uh, good notes be taken and supplied with the calibration certificates, making it more understandable and user-friendly as far as the user is concerned. Looking a little closer at the header, we see a couple of things we didn't see on example number one. Uh, the bubble number five there shows that this is the uh, address of the calibration lab, and also in this case would be the uh, calibration lab location, which would be uh, bullet or bubble number six. And then since this is a 17025 accredited laboratory, you see the logo in the upper right hand corner, that's our item number 25, which is A2LA associated or accredited uh, uh, logo. Also for bullet number seven and eight, we have the customer name and the customer address. In this case, to protect the innocent, the uh, two were blotted out. And uh, you, normally you would put the name and address in there for your uh, own records. Then we have the serial number, and there is also a certificate number that has been uh, generated here. Also on uh, page one, expanding the lower portion of that, we see the calibration information, which adds one new item here that we didn't see in example number one, and that's the bubble number 20, which has the environmental data for the temperature and the humidity. Temperature becomes an important factor, especially when you're talking about uh, electronic gear and low-level signals. The a show of evidence of traceability is item 22, and by listing the standards here used for calibration, we have that traceability documented. Notice here the use of uh, colors for the calibration data, and it uh, certainly brings a little clarity to the uh, understanding of the uh, channel data. Also note that the units are specified. The units here are micro strain, or one epsilon, and also the tolerances and values are recorded in the other columns here making it easy to identify whether we have in or out of uh, tolerance uh, different types of uh, conditions. Here's the graphical display of the data blowing up a little bit. We see that the visual representation here of the numbers and the graphic may not be required but it is somewhat of a wow factor and it makes it easier to understand and uh, get an overall picture without having to look through a whole lot of data numbers. It also displays trends and can display any problems that might exist as well. And it's also a nice looking product for the customer and it makes an easy picture for auditing as well. 
This completes the presentation on calibration certificates. I want to thank you for your attention. Please visit my website at http colon slash slash jg technology dot com. This presentation is now available on YouTube. Click the link on my website.